Life is Strange is a game that really encapsulates the type of narrative I love seeing in video games. It's a journey filled with suspense and just these grounded but extraordinary characters in an array of emotions and just a touch of fantastical all wrapped up with a style that makes the game feel like home, even if I've never seen a game like it before. But it's also a game where there are cracks at the foundation and it causes the grand ambitions that it has to just well, fall apart. It's fascinating to look at, both for what it does right. It is a fascinating game to look at, with how it's able to take like an ordinary setting with simple gameplay and turn that into an incredible experience. But it's also fascinating when you start looking at its flaws, and while they may seem minor at first glance, they tend to undermine a lot. At least in my opinion. Which part of the reason I'm making this video is because I just want to explore my opinion, understand how I feel about it. So yeah, this is going to be con some conflicting thoughts here. Though, despite my issues, I do like this game. Also, spoilers ahead, by the way. So Life is Strange focuses on this girl, Max, a student at a prestigious art school who loves photography. The gameplay is, well, rather simple actually. You control Max as she walks around places, then you pick things to look at or interact with and stuff like that. Seems simple enough, right? Well, early on in the game, Max witnesses a murder in the girl's bathroom. And then while reaching out to like try to do something, she discovers she has a power to rewind time. Max saves the life of this girl, learning that she was her childhood friend Chloe and together the two of them investigate a lot of mysteries about a missing girl named Rachel, the truth about the school, and just the conspiracies around the town as a whole. The game is all about the narrative, with the gameplay meant to just propel the story forward. And I like this feeling. There are no like real test of skill or boss battles or stuff like that, which is fine, perfect even for a game like this, because I think they just get in the way of what the game is trying to do. But what makes the game a rich experience, richer than just like a TV show, is the choices you make as Max, and the ability to rewind time. Max will be faced with a lot of difficult choices, knowing that what she chooses will impact the future, and because she can rewind time, she can like peer down both paths, but just a bit because her powers are very limited. And these choices are hard too, something Max along with the player experiences. There's oftentimes not a right answer. And her ability lets the player naturally fail trying to figure out the way through a given situation, but then able to try again until they get it right, which feels very natural instead of having an awkward checkpoint system. So the combination of the gameplay and narrative really works well to just create the mood of the game. And speaking of mood, that is one of the things the game absolutely nails. The whole game is just a mood. It makes me feel like I don't know how to describe it. The soundtrack is a big piece of it, just the way it creates the experience. A comment on one of the songs says it best. It makes me nostalgic for memories that never happened. And like, we have a style of the game. It's mostly realistic, but not quite. A few touches of unrealism, like in the character's eyes, that draws me into the fictional world. And this makes the soundtrack hit the right mood all the time. Even in times where it felt like the song was going for too long, it still felt like it fit. It did what it was supposed to do. And it's not like this whole style makes the offense feel real, because it doesn't. But it makes me feel like this is a familiar fictional world that I'm coming back to, despite never playing a game or seeing a story like this before. And it's strange too, most of the soundtrack I don't like that well on its own. But as part of the game, it just feels like part of the complete package. So does anyone else feel that way I'm about any of this? I'm actually curious just because I, yeah, I don't know. And you know it's weird. Typically when I look at a game critically for like a review or something, it is a gameplay and story that are the two foundations of the game. But for Life is Strange, it's the style that's instead the foundation. And then the narrative is built on top of that, with the gameplay as sort of the icing on top of it all. And I think that's why when I have issues with the story, and a lot of times it doesn't matter, because it fits with the style. It's like the world of this game is a high school the way Hollywood sees it. Not completely realistic, but presented in a way that it's something familiar. And so everything else just seems to fit into place. 
But that's not to say the story isn't good, because it has some amazing moments. I really like seeing the relationship between Max and Chloe form and how different the two characters are, but they really care about each other. And then there's also a ton of mystery with all the antagonists. And it was wonderful just trying to put together all the pieces. And there's literally a scene where you control Max and she puts together all the evidence they have to uncover the site of the big events, leading them to the dark room. Which, oh boy. Yeah, that's when things got real. And I also like the mix of more lighter hard moments, like the moments with Warren. Just because it counterbalances a serious tone. Because you don't want a game like this to be all super serious. And when it gets as dark as this does, well, you want balance. But one of the most impactful moments all throughout the game was when Max was able to bring Chloe's father back to life. Only to discover that by altering the timeline in that way, she caused a chain of events that led to Chloe getting into a horrible accident that left her paralyzed. And during this part of the game, I could feel how Max felt. She saved William, saved Chloe's family, but at a terrible cost. And again, it is so powerful. Like, I can relate to seeing an older family member having their health deteriorate. And it sucks. But as much as it is terrible, it's a natural part of life. Chloe, though, is young. She making this even more tragic. She should have her whole life in front of her. But here she is, unable to hardly move on her own. And Max is there seeing this all, knowing that it is all her fault. Of course, she saved Chloe's father, so was her decision right? And then Max is given one of the hardest choices in the game. Chloe asks her to increase the doses of her medicine, causing an overdose that would kill her. Or Max would do nothing, let Chloe continue living in this terrible pain, a life where she can't do anything. This decision is hard. But Max's choice was to go back in time again, make it so Chloe's father would be killed again. And we saw her looking at the fireplace, her expression as she faced it, just knowing that she was letting William go to his death. Her inaction of the moment caused untold suffering for Chloe and her family. But as she saw, so does interfering. You know, when I think about that part of the game, it's really having the drama cranked up as high as they possibly can. The most extreme possibilities were chosen. From a pure logical perspective, these events seem unlikely. But that goes back to the mood of the game, and the whole overly dramatic nature fits. I mean, consider that all the events of the game take place over five days, and it is filled with super dramatic plot lines. But it fits the foundation the style created, and while some and while many of the events first stretched, for the most part, they all are believable enough. And I think one of my favorite things about the game is just the characters. Many of the characters are presented as antagonists at first, but then when we get further along and we see that maybe they aren't so bad. The best example here is David, Chloe's stepfather. He's very antagonistic to Chloe and Max and really all the kids. But as we see later on, he actually does care a lot and is trying to get to the heart of the disappearances. He's even the one to save Max in episode 5. While the twist that he was good at all along made for a good plot twist, there's more to it than that. He's a character that was scarred by his time in the military. He doesn't know how to express his love and he spent time in an environment where one mistake could lead to the death of those around him. At first, I didn't like him. I did not like how he was portrayed. With it seemed like they're just taking the cliche of a hardened soldier, make that the villain. And this did rub me the wrong way. Like, I have a lot of respect for the military. I have several friends who are currently serving or have served in the past. And so to make a villain of that type of person, well, that just doesn't feel right. But then we see David here, and that his actions make sense. And the way he was portrayed at first is clouded because of Chloe's hatred for them. Sure, he's far from a perfect person, but that doesn't make him a bad guy. We also get this to a lesser degree with Victoria. While she's arrogant, she does grow throughout the series, and we see she does have a caring side to her as well. And even Nathan, despite being one of the villains of the game, had his actions somewhat justified, though not redeemed. And that's good. The multifaceted nature of the characters is what makes him so great. 
like real people, there's a lot more to them than you can see at first glance. And people are rarely good or evil alone. They're human. And Max's main character is also interesting. Partly because she isn't interesting. She feels unoriginal. Like, if I told you about the overall premise and showed you the style, you would know that a character like Max is the main character. She's, like, mostly a loner. A couple of good friends, but also a good person who would do anything for those she cares about. Typical, like, main character stuff. But instead of being overly cliche, she just fits with the type of the story. Again, the style is the foundation of the game. So a main character that goes with the style is wonderful. And with the player and Max being one and the same, having Max be an easy character to understand just helps with the immersion. And yeah, I know I talked about this earlier, but I want to go back to the time manipulation aspects of the game. Because I love time travel in storytelling. It's not like science fiction. It's fantastical, but it's something that I can wrap my mind around. But it also lets the story unfold differently. It changes the logical order of events. Typically, you go from event A, then event B, then event C. But with time travel, you can go from A to C, back to B, or change B so that now C is different. It's mentally stimulating to keep track of it all. And this lets Max gather knowledge outside of chronological order. She can talk to someone, learn something, rewind time. Now they don't know they talked to her, but she can use that information, get more information, and so on. Or she can destroy something, get evidence she needs, get the evidence, and then undestroy it, but still have that tool or object or knowledge or whatever. And then when there is actual time travel, mainly in Chapter 5, things got crazy. And I love it when things got crazy like this. In fact, I just love the experience of not knowing what's going on, and I got plenty of that here. That's why I play games like this. The idea of not knowing. And I like experiencing something weird, but with the promise that it'll all make sense later on. And that really is Life is Strange. And speaking of not having an answer, that is how I felt when I learned about Mr. Jefferson. Okay, I did have a sort of feeling that maybe there's more to him, but him being the main villain? Yeah, I was not expecting that. And I was completely shocked with how he was introduced as a villain. Knocking Max out, making her unable to use her powers, and then shooting and killing Chloe. But looking back, the foreshadowing was there. And I liked how he kept going back to the first scene of the game, where he was talking about a dark room. And that twist, and that foreshadowing, bringing that back to life, while also seeing the type of person he really was. Yeah, that's how you tell a good story. You know, that's another thing about the time trial aspect. You can highlight this clever foreshadowing without feeling forced. Plus, I liked how Mr. Jefferson's motivations were derived from his love of art, and he wanted to capture people's emotions and expression when they lose hope and give in to despair. This is weird and lets his actions make sense from his perspective while still making him a pure evil villain that doesn't get redeemed. The final chapter also really raised the stakes for the big finale too, with Max needing to get out of the dark room, using her time travel powers to find a way out, but also finding that in her attempt to make everything right, the storm would come and destroy all those she cares about. And then when the storm hit, that was so good. She escaped the dark room, stole Mr. Jefferson's car, drove through the rain, was trying to walk through the streets to get to the Two Wells Diner, kept it from blowing up. And just this whole scene, it reminded me of the prologue in The Last of Us. And I love that scene. So yeah, this was great. And it was great right up until the end. And that's when things fell apart. Yeah, we're going to get a bit negative here. It is revealed that the storm and all the other weird events are caused by Maxine's inner powers. And the only way to stop the storm is to her to use a picture of the butterfly she took to go back to where Chloe was killed and basically do nothing there. And I did not care for this at all. First of all, the storm being caused by Max's powers makes no sense. We don't understand a lot about Max's powers, and that's fine. But because we don't understand a lot about her powers... They have to be really careful with how they link it to other events because there is no logical leap for us to take for it to make sense. And so there's no way to logically connect our powers to the storm or the eclipse or the multiple moons or the snow or the beached whales or any of that. Like, how does her using her power to re rewind time make all this weird stuff happen? 
In fact, the only reason it seems like the story went to this direction to give Max this choice was to make this the most dramatic choice possible. And the other dramatic events of the game had some logical reason for them. Like Kate got involved with the Vortex Club and because of Mr. Jefferson and Nathan was drugged, then filmed, then bullied, then tried to kill herself. Sure, all very dramatic, but there's a logical chain of events that happened that got us to that point. But here it's just because they need a big finale twist. And sure, an explanation might be to go to chaos theory, how one small change in the past can have a big change in the future. So maybe like Max walked a certain way, she caused a small gust of wind that led to the tornado. That kind of almost sort of makes sense. But even if it did make sense, then why didn't all the other small changes she made trying to undo it also have a big effect on the tornado and the storm? Like she walked a different direction, she caused the gust of wind to blow differently. So instead of the storm hitting her town, it hit Los Angeles or whatever. And the choice to either sacrifice Chloe or the town feels unsatisfying either way. If she chooses to sacrifice the town, it's implied and I think maybe confirmed in the second game that everyone is killed, except for like a few characters. So all the time spent helping characters like Kate or Victoria or Warren don't matter because they're dead. And if you choose to sacrifice Chloe, then the whole game is pointless because none of those events you went through ended up happening. Though it just so happens that if you go down that route, then everything works out fine despite Max not doing anything. Other than Chloe's death, of course, being sad. And I get that this is meant to be a tragic decision, one without a good answer, to illustrate that despite Max's efforts, she can't save everyone. But they could still have that with the ending feeling satisfying. Like, maybe instead of this choice, they would make it impossible for her to save both Chloe and Warren. So she has to lose one of them. She could have made a difference in everyone else's lives, fought as hard as she could to help everyone, just but just have an impossible situation. And what is the point of her getting powers if it just so happens she can't do anything with him? And I've seen that the theme of the game is that you cannot change the past. You have to accept and move on. But how does that make sense when you literally give the main character the power to change the past? And it's basically saying that if you're given a special gift, you should just not do anything with it at all because that's bad. You shouldn't mess with things. But no, that's not right. If you have a gift, you should use it as best you can to make the world a better place. And yes, maybe you'll mess up. Maybe you'll make things worse by accident. But you should still strive with every effort to make the world a better place with what gifts you do have. It's like the theme here is basically saying don't use your gifts to make the world a better place and just let things play out even if they're sad because that will all work out in the end. It's, that just doesn't feel good. And also, her going back in time with the butterfly here doesn't make sense either because so far she'd only been able to go back in time with pictures of her. So why now the butterfly? And why did she just give up here? Why not try going back in time and find a way to evacuate the town? Like send a message to Warren, then save Chloe, and then tell her. And she has plenty of options, so why not take them or explore them? But yes, speaking of the link between the choices and consequences, there is none. Most of the time. One of the big points in the game that tells you from the start is that your choices matter. They will have consequences. But then they largely don't. Most of the impacts of your choices are pretty minor, like they'll change some dialogue later or slightly alter how an event unfolds. But despite all the choices a player makes, the story is nearly the same. You still go through the same basic plot beats, like you meet up with Chloe, have the conflict with David, have Kate want to kill herself, have Max go back to save William, decide that was a bad idea, undo that, and so on. Really, the only choice that felt like it did matter was whether you save Kate or not. But then the story goes in the same direction from there, just some different dialogue and maybe Kate helping you if you let her live. And when the major draw of the game, the major way it's presented is that your choices matter, but they don't, that just feels wrong. And taking a step back, none of the choices but the final one actually matter in the end. If you choose to sacrifice the town, pretty much everyone dies, so any development or relationships that are built are now gone now. Even if you save Kate, she's gone three days later, so what's the point? And if you choose to sacrifice Chloe, then all the choices Max made all throughout the game are undone. So they don't matter. It's like the game is trying to have the theme that the choices you make matter in life. 
but then the end of the game just tramples on that theme. Especially since by sacrificing Chloe, everything falls into place. So again, it's like the message of the game is, don't do anything at all, it'll all work out. Which I don't think that's what they're going for at all. Then there's also the part near the end where Max goes through that nightmare and seems to be blaming herself for not doing more or causing problems. But this also doesn't seem to fit her personality before that. Yes, I get the logic that she was in the dark room. That messed her up. I get that. But why didn't we see any of this before she had the nightmare? Like, after she got out of the dark room. She's very driven. She's like, I go, I need to go find Warren, get the picture, go back in time, stop everything from going terrible. But then you have the nightmare where it's like all of her personality has changed. Now, it was cool and weird and but it felt like another case of just adding more drama for the big finale that didn't make sense. And then there's also the fact that it doesn't make sense that Max ripping up her original photo would lead to her being back in the dark room after she had escaped it the first time. Like, here's the thing. The way time works is that events in the past cause events in the future. So that would mean that the first event in the timeline that we have seen is her tearing up her picture, and that would affect all future events. Later on, she made the text to David telling him about Mr. Jefferson. Now, the game's logic is that by tearing up the picture, she made Mr. Jefferson mad when she was captured, and therefore he burnt the picture that allowed her to go back to the time when she sent the text message. However, by that logic, when she sent the text, she erased the future where she jumped back in time, but the text still existed. Thus proving that just because she jumps back in time and changes something that would stop her from jumping back in time to do that change, that doesn't mean the effects of her going back in time just go away. Does that make sense? My head hurts. So yeah, there's a lot to this game. A lot I like. A lot I really like. And I'm probably leaving some stuff out. I'm sure I am, but I don't want to know how long I've been talking about this. But then I get to the ending. I brought everything together and then it just doesn't it doesn't feel right and that is the most important moment for the game to get right because that wraps everything together and i feel i didn't but that's the thing though is an experience like this about the journey or the destination and does the answer change if the destination invalidates the whole journey i don't know it's an interesting question to think about, especially if I'm trying to like be critical. You could also say that when you experience a game, you're meant to experience it, not think too much. But a game like Life is Strange, I feel is meant to be thought about. You're meant to consider all these different things, the different timelines, the different choices, and all that. So I want a game that can engage with me on that level, and when it falls short, well, it just feels like the game as a whole falls short. So yeah, it's a good game, don't get me wrong. A lot to like. But to say it's a masterpiece or a wonderful game or one of the best games ever, well, this is why I disagree. Thank you for watching, though. I hope you enjoyed this video. I enjoyed making it, thinking about all these things. And if you're interested in more games from this creator, then make sure you go check out my Twitch stream. Actually, I'll probably be streaming it on YouTube as well. But the game Tell Me Why is from the same studio, and it came out recently, and I'll be uh, streaming it on Twitch and YouTube, hopefully. So go check that out. Watch me be confused and have no idea what's going on, because I'm sure that will be a fun time for all. So yes, thank you for watching, and I will see you all next time.